Good afternoon. My name is uh, Thomas Bona. I'm a partner at Pillinger Miller Toronto. And I'm the moderator for today's conference webinar. I'd like to welcome you to our third Pillinger Miller Toronto and St. John's University Greenberg School of Risk Management conference series webinar. This series is designed to examine issues, trends, and ideas that affect our industry and examine them with industry leaders. Uh, we have an informative and provocative topic today. And I'd like to first thank Dean Norian Sharp of the St. John's Tobin College of Business for her support of our conference series. I'd also like to thank Dean Brandon Switzer of the School of Risk Management, the Greenberg School of Risk Management, and Larry Pistel, the director of the Center of Executive Education for his help with the nuts and bolts of putting this thing together. Um, I'd also like to thank our panelists and my partners at Pillinger Miller Toronto. And uh, I'd also like to thank um, Dr. Brown. I'd like to thank Jack Jennings and Doug Miller for giving us their time today and joining us on this panel. Uh, what I first like to do is I'd like to have the panelists just say a few words and introduce themselves and then we'll dig into the topic. Uh, first, Mark Pillinger. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mark Pillinger. I'm one of the founding partners at Pillinger Miller Toralo. Um, I'm based out of our Westchester office. We have offices in Manhattan, Syracuse, Buffalo, Philadelphia, uh, Garden City, Oceanside, New Jersey, Connecticut, and California. Uh, I am AV rated. I am a board member of the New York City Trial Lawyers. I am a board member of the New York State Association Academy of Trial Lawyers. They are the largest trial lawyer organization um, in the country. And I have been tracking this legislation because I have been following the lobbyists as they have been pushing this these pieces of legislation forward. Next, uh, Jeff Miller, could you say a few words? Jeff Miller, one of the founding partners at Pill and Jamila Toralo, and looking forward to discussing this with all of you today. And thanks for your time and attention. Jeff Shulman, could you please uh, tell us a little about, about yourself? Yes, good afternoon. Uh, I am Jeff Shulman, partner with the firm, and I run the upstate offices, including Syracuse and Buffalo. We cover the entire upstate region from points east as far as Albany, as far west as Buffalo, and all the way up to the north country. Um, I've been tracking Mark, who's been tracking the law, so I'll be on top of Mark today. <laughs> and uh, Neil Samberski, would you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Neil Samborski. I run the firm's Garden City office. I'm in, in charge of the firm's insurance coverage practice, uh, which spans certainly New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. My coverage practice is throughout the country, uh, rendering opinions and DJ actions apart from uh, my extensive coverage practice and the extensive coverage practice of the firm. I do a tremendous amount of defense work, which we're not here to talk about today. So look forward to this seminar. Um, Tom didn't mention, but if during the seminar anybody has a question, no such thing as a silly question, you can type it in the chat box and we will do our best to answer it. I promise I will keep you anonymous in the question so no one has to have any fear of being called out for asking a question. So look forward to it. Thanks, Neil. I did forget to mention that and I thank you for uh, handling our uh, question uh, and answer uh, duties. Uh, Dr. Brown, could you please uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, thanks, Tom. It's a pleasure to be part of the, um, the talk today. I am the faculty chair of the Maurice R. Greenberg School of Risk Management, which is one of the top rated um, risk management insurance uh, programs in the world. We're recognized as a global center of insurance excellence by the International Insurance Society. I'm an applied economist. I've studied a lot of different issues um, in risk management and insurance. I've served as the president of the Risk Theory Society, the European Group of Risk and Insurance Economists, um, the American Risk and Insurance Association, and I've done a fair amount of research on um, 
the economics of, of tort reform, including bad faith. So it's a pleasure to be here today, Tom. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Brown, for having, uh, for joining us. And as I did want to mention, uh, our firm and uh, myself, we have deep ties to St. John's and we really enjoy putting on our conference series webinars with St. John's. It's a privilege and it's an honor. Uh, Doug uh, Miller, would you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Hello, everybody. I I'm Douglas Milner. Uh, I'm currently uh, the Assistant Vice President, Claim Account Manager over here at AXA XL. Been here for about 10 years. Uh, been in the claims, insurance claims industry uh, for well over 25. Uh, I've been, had, had stops at various other uh, carriers along the way. Um, unfortunately, Pillinger Militarello did not pay me enough to put on a tie and suit. <laughs> so I am talking to you with a button down shirt in the basement of my house. Uh, <laughs> pleased to be here and uh, we'll enjoy an engaged conversation. That's a very, Thank very you. nice view of your basement. Very nice yeah. view. <laughs> and uh, finally, uh, Jack Jennings, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jack Jennings. Um, I have. Uh, I'll say I have two jobs. The first, the one that brought me here, I am um, uh, happy to serve for several years now as an adjunct professor at Greenberg School of Risk um, Insurance and Actuarial Science. Um, and uh, secondly, I am an executive vice president with Willis Towers Watson, and I will... Uh, mm try to draw on both those perspectives uh, um, to help things uh, today. Thanks so much, uh, Jack and all the panelists. So let's uh, dig into our topic. Our topic is, uh, it's informative and it's provocative because it's something that uh, could happen. And uh, given the way the legislature is, is, is trending, we may be talking about this as a, as a given fact, but you know, um, Natural events like hurricanes in Florida and the condo collapse in Florida and wildfires in California serve as you know, natural change agents where insurance companies look at their offerings and decide whether they want to continue to write insurance in those particular areas. And our thought here today, our, one of the ideas that we want to examine is are uh, progressive legislation and judicial decisions in New York doing to the insurance market and availability, what natural disasters might do otherwise. Now, um, Mark uh, Pillinger has been at the forefront of this, as he said, he's written three articles about bad faith, uh, one in ALM Law 360, one in Thomson Reuters, and one in Insider Engage. So he's really been raising uh, this issue and bringing it to the forefront. So let me first start with Mark. Uh, is this just something that we should be concerned about? Is this uh, much ado about nothing or uh, are we just blowing some smoke here with this uh, idea that this bad faith could actually happen in New York? Mark? Thank you, Tom. Um, this is frightening to the insurance. All of everything Joe, I could say- I have a slide of four, please, Rob? Everything I say is uh, my opinion. Uh, it's not the opinion of any of the boards I sit on. Uh, so you all have my disclaimer. I don't even know if it's Miller or Shulman or Samberski's um, opinion, but they, we're really dealing with three bills here. Bill 7285, which is bad faith. Bill 7052, which is mandatory disclosure. And Bill 5623, which creates a private cause of action in bad faith. I'm gonna let Neil talk about uh, bad faith as it currently exists uh, in New York. But let me say that these proposals will dramatically change the insurance industry in New York as we know it. And I personally feel that they are draconian measures which place obligations on insurance companies that they will have difficulty in meeting, which opens themselves up for bad faith. 
puts a chilling effect on negotiations and will drive up the cost of settlements. And at the end of the day, may make New York a far less palatable place to do business than it is now. And join us with Texas, Colorado, Georgia, um, Florida, et cetera. Very briefly, um, Bill 7225 creates a private cause of action against an insurer who has refused or delayed to make payment. This enables the plaintiff to recover interest costs, disbursements, attorney's fees, consequential and punitive damages for bad faith. But next slide, please, Joe. When you look at this, the it places a duty on the carriers and I would submit the attorneys, which frightens me because, you know, this could affect my malpractice, uh, to mandate that all policies be disclosed to the plaintiffs before the start of the trial. And that means primary and excess. If the carrier refuses to pay, settle, and or settle, or unreasonably delays payment of the claim, the plaintiffs would be entitled to recover the amount due under the policy. The carrier has to evaluate the claim within six months and settle or reject within 30 days of an accusation of bad faith. The, now, uh, I'm sorry, Mark. Well, it also creates a private cause of action against the insurers. Before this, the plaintiff had to, the insured had to assign their rights to the plaintiff. And Neil's going to go into this. But this truly expands the scope of um, the obligations. And I know, Tom, you really don't want to get into the nuts and bolts, but the carrier has to show that they have given equal, if not greater, consideration, next slide, to their insured rather than their own interests, that they issue a timely denial, that they assess liability, that they have to advise the, um, under Bill 7052, they have to advise the plaintiffs and their insureds of the name of the adjuster. If it's a TPA, the name of the person who makes the determinations under the policy, how many claims have been filed under the policy, the names of the claimants and their attorneys under the policy, how much of the policy has been eroded, and they have to do all of this within 60 days. And when I say the names of the adjusters um, and the claims professionals at the carriers, it's not only their names, but it's the names of the, it's also their contact information. So and let me just interrupt uh, right here for a second, because I'd want to go back just for a little bit. Can you put slide eight on please, uh, Rob? Uh, and I want to ask Neil about the bad faith element, and we'll go back into the disclosure law in a little bit. But uh, Neil, as you know, because you handle coverage and you do it on a 50 state basis, so you know where we are versus other states, New York State, a standard comes from 1993, and it's a, a, a standard which requires a reckless disregard. Now, I mean, New York is probably in the very minority of states. Many states have toughened their, uh, their 
um, their regulation of insurers on the bad faith side, on the first party side, um, is New York running against the tide? Is it time for New York to do something different than the reckless disregard of Pavia? Uh, where do you see this? So as of now, as recently as this week, I've had to write an opinion for a client about bad faith in New York. <clears throat> Generally, when clients ask me about bad faith in New York, I say it's almost impossible uh, to get bad faith against an insurer. Virtually, you know, the, the bad faith cases I've defended, we've won generally on summary judgment. It's not a reckless disregard standard under Pavia. It's actually a gross disregard standard. It's even a higher standard than reckless disregard. And when you look at the bill in 7285, the language is failed to effectuate a prompt and fair settlement by failing to give reasonable accord or at least equal or more favorable consideration to its insured's interests as it did its own. Under Pavia, the standard at common law to establish gross disregard you had to establish a pattern evincing a conscious or knowing indifference to the probability that an insured would be held personally accountable for a large or excess judgment if a settlement offer within policy limits were not accepted. So the question in my mind when I look at this bill is are they trying to expand what is bad faith in New York right now, which is an extremely difficult threshold to meet. Um, when you read the bill, both in that provision and in others, quite frankly, it's, it's somewhat vague and it's going to be rife for litigation. But going back to one of your earlier questions, Tom, bad faith in New York is extremely difficult. If we were having discussions about Washington State, Texas, Florida, we would, West Virginia, we'd be having a different conversation where bad faith is a reality. Um, and it's something that insurance companies are faced with on a daily basis on how they handle claims to avoid potential bad faith. New York, that's really been a, a non-issue. I would say if this bill is passed and makes it out of committee and is put into place, then it becomes a real issue. And you know, one of the issues Mark was talking about is giving someone a private, an injured party or a claimant a private cause of action. That does not exist right now. The only way a potential claimant can, can you know, meritoriously have a direct cause of action against an insurance company is if there's been a judgment against the insured that has gone unsatisfied for more than 30 days and they have a claim against them, then that claimant can institute an action against the insurance company. And that's the Lang case in New York. Right, so Lang has been the law for quite some time now. This bill will change that and it will start to spawn lawsuits by the plaintiffs who want to try and get coverage. Let me ask you this question, Neil. Given the fact that maybe 45 other states or 46 or whatever the number might be are, have already moved in that area, is it not likely that New York is, is eventually gonna move in that area and move away from the Pavia standard to something along the lines of the private cause of action? Well, if they're trying to, I hate to say if New York is trying to go in lockstep with other states, but if they're trying to perhaps shadow or somehow adopt some, some of the standards to make, I, I don't want to use the, the word, if they're trying to draft measures to make insurance companies more accountable to their insureds for what they do, um, not saying anyone's doing anything wrong, but if they want to put together some kind of a statute, well, this is certainly, I don't want to say a step in that direction. It's a long jump um, because this is rather sweeping. Um, and, it, and, it, you know, and it is troubling. It is troubling. Let me, uh, let me just turn to say uh, Jack and, uh, and Doug who are in the insurance side of this. If there is a bad faith bill, such as the one we're discussing, if that were to come to pass, do you think this would cause insurers uh, not to write business in New York or to uh, reconsider or to give it a harder look? What do you think about that, Jack and Doug? Well, I, I, 
you know, let's define um, what it means, you know, for uh, what we mean by availability of insurance. I, I doubt that insurers would formally uh, retreat from the market um, because most insurers today are large multi-line insurers and they can't, they, they, their state regulators would not allow them to retreat on uh, one line of business yet, you know, remain flush and making money in other lines of business. Uh, but what we have seen happening is that uh, um, in the construction business in particular, um, insureds are forced to take significant retentions. So a, a general liability policy with limits of $3 million slash $6 million will have a $3 million deductible. So in effect, the insured is self-insuring the first $3 million. And, you know, and there are costs around that, fronting charges and letter of credit guaranteeing that the insurance company will be reimbursed. So uh, I think that's the, uh, uh, um, that's what's happening. That's what's likely to uh, continue happening. And um, I don't think, and, you know, maybe, maybe Mark Brown knows differently, but I don't know of any, uh, measure, say an annual measure that keeps track of uh, how much insurance type risk uh, insureds retain and how that changes over time. Um, but if someone, you know, if someone did that, um, I think we would see for the reasons we are discussing today and many other reasons that uh, uh, increased retention, disguised self-insurance, because to the rest of the right. world, it looks like the contractor has a, a $3 million, $6 million policy, but in reality, it's a fronted arrangement and the, the contractor is a self-insurer. Doug, have you oh, found that? One second, sorry, saying? Tom. Uh, Joe, one of the, one of the uh, participants has asked that the slides be kept up. Um, so maybe you can just keep up one of the, the agenda or one of the slides that provides some information. Thanks, Neil. I apologize, Tom. I didn't. No, mean no, no, no. I appreciate that. You know, we want to make this as accessible as possible, and that's absolutely a perfect thing to do. Uh, Doug, from your experience, is that what you are seeing as well? Uh, you're, you're muted there. Yeah, thank you. So to dovetail on what Jack is saying. Um, I mean, currently where I sit at XXL, we do uh, uh, request or part of our, one of our provisions to ensure in New York, given the current labor law climate is a large retention. And sometimes just like Jack said, a fronted policy where it's pretty much, you know, a, a large retention equal to the amount of the limits on the policy. Um, and I would, I would assume that we would probably become a little bit more restrictive as what we write. We, we will stay, still maintain biz, uh, our business in New York, um, but I think that we would find other ways and we would be a little bit more restrictive. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing also is, is that we have sometimes uh, policies out there where you know they cover a client from most of the states of the country, but that we would write a separate policy for New York under general liability for a larger retention um, and a higher premium. So uh, due to the risks that we currently have today. So, so if litigation to be, I would assume that the premiums, premium dollar would probably go up and our, our criteria to write in New York would probably become a little bit more restrictive. Well, this Thank is, you, Doug. This is Neil, Doug. Thanks. I've got a question for you on, on, that, on that accord. So let's assume these, the, you know, these bills make it out of committee and become law. And so now New York, you know, ha these aren't attached to a particular line of business, obviously. Um, when you're looking at writing a risk, for example, in a state like Washington or Texas or Florida, 
which might have an analogous statute, you know, own, the onerous conditions that we're looking at here in New York, are your policies priced differently in those states? And would you find, is that what would happen in New York based upon an insurance regulation? Would you change your pricing? I couldn't say for definitely sure that we would, but I think that it would go into the analysis of, uh, of the premium. Um, you know, just like uh, construction defect, you name Florida, you name Texas, you name you know, California as well. Uh, those are fairly high CD uh, po uh, uh, states and it probably is contemplated when the underwriter does look at writing a policy for general liability as well as auto, um, that uh, those areas are considered. Florida, uh, I could speak personally, we have quite an issue because of their bad faith statute there um, and their uh, very friendly, uh, I, I would say, uh, insurance uh, administration over there, that a very a simple letter that normally we get from a plaintiff attorney in an auto loss, let's just say, and they request the copy of our policy, policy limits and, and terms and things like that. If that isn't answered within, I forgot, 21, 30 days or something to that effect, I forgot what the exact days are, Yeah, uh, they can make an, a complaint to the insurance department and we could be fine. A simple request. So those kind of things we get on a daily basis. I know that some of my brethren in the, in the insurance in industry gets, get, get that as well. And I'm almost certain that, that those kind of areas are contemplated um, when figuring out premium for whether it's auto or general liability and those kind of things. The other side that we're a little concerned with as a carrier is we're looking at these, these, uh, these, these proposed bills of litigation but we all know once it gets out there, it can be interpreted, massaged, or changed in certain ways where it unfortunately creates a little bit more advantage even you know, for the claimants as well. I mean, this is a lot of the stuff talks about policyholder and things that affect and the claimants, but there are angles that people could take that I don't think the, uh, our current legislature contemplated at all. Yeah, well, and I would agree with you. Point. There's certainly, I'm sorry, Tom. No, no, excellent. Great I was going to say that the, the way the, the bills are certainly are written now, they're certainly vague. And, you know, Tom, you had asked earlier, do you think New York would go in that would go in this direction? I, I would think, you know, one of one of the signals that they might was the adoption of, you know, the amendment to insurance law 3420D, right? You know, yeah. New York, as far as I'm aware, is alone in that type of insurance regulation where you've got this time in which you have to disclaim, you know, it's, you know, I'm t I, I counsel my clients, if not every day, three times a day as to how on top of their claims they have to be in New York in a bodily injury or wrongful death case um, to make sure you're compliant with 3420. You forget to copy a co-defendant in a case your disclaimer is invalid against them. So could could this bill be enacted? I, I think it could. And you know, and the, the initial the, the initial salvo, you know, the initial shot across the bow to insurance carriers was 3420 and what was yeah. done in 2009. In my opinion, well, first of all, let me just comment that the reporting requirements and the requirements on the carrier to advise not only their own insured, but potential claimants of the amount of coverage available um, are onerous and re uh, continuing obligation, including the policy being eroded. The legislature in New York, both uh, the Assembly and the Senate, the Democrats have a supermajority. It is a very progressive body. The, our former governor, um, uh, for all his faults, was a check on some of the more, um, I'm 
trying to pick the right word. Um, so legislature that would have had a negative effect on business. Uh, as we all know, he's gone. The candidates who have announced so far uh, either are a progressive or if they're moderate, I'm not sure that they would have the political muscle to veto and sustain this legislation, this type of legislation. That's so, a good point, Mark. Very good point. Um, I think I that if not in the current form format that they are, um, we're going to get something. I'm confident that something is going to come out and the rules are going to change. So let me just move on for a bit here and talk about um, the next thing, which would be um, what would bad faith legislation do to damage awards? And we're very fortunate that we have uh, Dr. Brown, who back in uh, 2004, could I have slide nine, please? Back in 2004, Dr. Brown, uh, you wrote a, um, uh, a paper in the Journal of Legal Studies with two other authors, and it was about the effect of bad faith laws on first party insurance claim decisions. Now, this was uh, from 1992, and you found that there was a positive uh, correlation between bad faith remedies and higher settlement payments, both for economic and non-economic damages. Do you expect that we would find the same uh, correlation today if such a bad faith law was enacted in New York? Yeah, and that's a, that's a really good question, Tom. Um, oftentimes, as you know, the devil's in the details with a lot of yes. these things. And what we were able to look at back then was whether there was a bad faith law at all in place um, versus whether there wasn't. And as, as the panelists today have um, talked about this issue, I think it's, it's pretty obvious to everybody that there's a lot of different issues involved and how it cuts. It's um, it's hard to say, but but back then um, we did find that economic damages for first party auto claims were 13.7% higher in the states that did have bad faith laws. So that's by no means a small effect. Um, so, um, you know, it, it has it has an effect. There, there's no doubt about it. And it also affects the likelihood of um, claims being paid, I believe. I did not test that at that point in time, but you can imagine if you're an insurance company and you've got a, a claim that's sort of in the gray zone and there's the, um, the shadow of the law with a, a bad faith claim potential that you'd be more likely to settle. Now, I, I think from a policy perspective, um, you have to ask yourself, well, is this good? Is this bad? Is this indifferent? As, as an economist, what's important to me is how, how well the insurance market works and how capable individuals are to, to be able to move risk through the markets. And I think that ultimately becomes a really important question. Thanks, Dr. Brown. Now, some people have pointed to the Florida experience uh, and I'll say it's not for the sun and the, uh, and the water and everything, but it's for the fact that they have a private cause of action. And given the private cause of action, the 2018 report of the Insurance Research Council found that there was a, you know, if more claims and higher uh, premiums as a result of a, a private cause of action. Do you think that would be something that we might find here, uh, Dr. Brown and uh, Jack and Doug and anyone else? I think it's altogether possible. Um, it, it certainly would be in, in expectation. What, whether we would or not, um, ultimately would come down to, um, to how things played out. It would be a really interesting question to look at, but um, a priori, um, yes, I would expect an effect. Okay, now some would argue that, uh, for example, bad faith claims are so small and the amounts that are paid on them really are too small to affect insurer you know, a profitability because they're spread out over a large, large body. Uh, do you think this is the case, uh, Neil, Doug, Dr. Brown? Yeah, um, well, well, again, Tom, what we found was a 13.7% a um, increase in premium. So that, that's an effect, it, it's not, um, not insignificant at all. So 
you know, you can look at it at the amount of bad faith claims relative to the amount of premium in the market. And that might, that might be small. If you looked at it as a percentage of claims paid, that, that's going to be different. Um, but, but we did find an effect. And, and what that would be with this New York law, hard to tell at this point. And, quite and it would also depend on the size of the claim. If it's a big claim and there's punitive damages, depending upon the multiplier, Tom, obviously it could be quite significant. Of course. And, and Doug can correct me if I'm wrong on this. If an insurance company has to pay bad faith, which are extra, extra contractual damages, I do not believe that's something that's laid off on reinsurance. That's hard money paid by the insurance company. I yeah. believe that Neil, you're. I believe that you're correct in that aspect. And and here's the other side. I mean, we're looking at a bad faith, and I think as as Dr. Brown put forward, that if you look at it just like bad faith, that's one thing. But now, when a carrier gets a claim, we're already, you know, in uh, under pressure. We're in the back seat. There's an extensive, um, a, a excessive amount of pressure to meet those guidelines and deadlines and criteria. And I think as Mark put in some of his articles, it also, what would deter, what would deter a, a current policyholder who would normally not report a claim because they know maybe it's not covered, maybe it is, to report that claim and maybe it skips a guy, maybe the claim rep misses a guideline or maybe something happens. Now all of a sudden there's an additive pressure on the insurance carrier. There are additional claims being reported. There are additional fees being paid. Um, it's a whole litany of things. So I think it's hard to kind of specifically say, well, you know, bad faith, they don't much get it, but what does the bad faith do when a claim is presented and how a claim rep and, and a carrier handle it, it changes completely. I, 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 would, I would probably have to say that it does because it adds a, another level of pressure, undue pressure on the carrier to make sure that those, that criteria is met as well, you know, as well as I do, the plaintiff lobby sitting there chirping in the background, just waiting, just waiting for something to step out of line so they could just come right in and say, bad faith, bad faith, you better step up now. You know, originally I wanted this, now I want that. Yeah, also, and, you think, you and, think and another point, more, to, more sorry, Tom, an, an, yeah. another yeah. point on the comment of maybe it's small. I, I've yet to have a, a client who I'm doing coverage for, where perhaps we're facing a bad faith allegation, maybe it's not significant, you know, relative, you know, using your word. I've yet to have anyone say, oh, it's, in, it's insignificant bad faith. We don't care. So I just want to- about that. You know, let me, let me bold and underline this. No insurance carrier ever wants to have a bad faith claim against them of any magnitude for a whole litany of reasons. Forget internal reporting purposes, publicity, or if you're talking about litigating bad faith claims, right? Perhaps in other states, and all of a sudden you become the insurance company committing bad faith. Well, now all of a sudden, when you talk about the notion of an insignificant bad faith, and I, I'm just using that term, I don't think any bad faith is insignificant, but when you have, if, if you have an insurance company who all of a sudden their pattern and practice, where I'll put that in quotation marks, is they have bad faith judgments against them. Then when they're sued in a number of states, that starts to add to a potential multiplier. Um, and those are the indicia that go into bad faith awards against insurance companies. So to me, there's no such thing as an insignificant bad faith or insignificant consequence of it. It's a big deal. And, and isn't it I, so? I know I when we deal with, when I deal with it, it's always a big deal. I would just like just to add, add to the pressure to settle cases also, Mark. Just, I'm sorry, Tom. No, but, I'm just saying, won't this add pressure to settle cases? Because once you bring out the, the, the card, once you play the, the bad faith card, all of a sudden you've got somebody's attention is going to say, you know what, let's just get rid of this case. We, we're not going to deal with that. So definitely, uh, I just want to Doug tell on something that Doug said. The time constraints on the carrier's actions in these new bills are very tight uh, in an industry where adjusters have many, many files. I'm not so sure the, the actions that the carriers will have to set up. 
But also following what Neil said in, in response to your questions, these bills allow for compensatory damages punitive or exemplary damages and interest. Now, I don't know what the interest rates would be in New York, but interest rates in New York on judgments now are 9%. Plus, the carriers find themselves in a position where they get a demand or they make an offer, the case goes sour, um, as cases do. The plaintiff rings a significant verdict. And that, in, by my interpretation of the statute, automatically means the carrier's in bad faith. If you're the carrier for all of the reasons that Neil and Doug pointed out. And carriers are risk adverse to begin with. I wouldn't take that risk if it was the Mark Pillinger insurance company. You know, it's go, it's not in your reserves. This is coming out of your corporate assets. Well, so we can agree that there's a significant, well, there's there would be significant effects from the bad faith legislation if it were to pass in New York. And it seems to be the sentiment that something will happen. The question is when, will it be, uh, uh, will it be um, watered down, quote unquote? Will it be uh, given more standard or more, uh, more clarification? We don't know, but it would seem from everybody's uh, conversation that this is something that we're gonna have to keep our eyes on. We should be concerned about it. And it's gonna be something that, that will definitely be in the, in the future. Let me turn to something else, uh, which again always gets a lot of a lot of um, um, print and otherwise. Will recent damage awards become the new normal in New York? Number ten, please. Uh, we had a eighty million dollar verdict that uh, in the uh, Perez versus Live Nation, which was reduced uh, down finally by the appellate division. Uh, 20 million in non-economic damages. Ben Morelli, the plaintiff's attorney, calls this the modern era of pain and suffering. And on the other side, the Lawsuit Reform Alliance of New York calls the $20 million uh, verdict an existential financial threat. So is it both? Or you know, is this just now the bar has been ratcheted up? Used to be 10 million, now it's 20, and it's taken off. Jeff and Jeff, you want to tackle that one? Sure. Um, I think, you know, and not sharing my age here, but <laughs> growing up in this industry, I remember as a younger attorney, uh, those $600,000, $700,000 cases were the biggest cases. Every now and then you'd hear about a million dollar case. And it was a huge thing because it was a seven figure case. Now, in our labor law book, we have countless seven-figure cases, many eight-figure cases. And I think the bar is just going up. I think that the numbers that we're seeing out there and what the appellate division um, will allow people to keep or not just keeps on creeping up a bit. And I think we're seeing it in everything from just regular pain and suffering awards to the esoteric um, fear of impending death, loss of parental guidance type of claims as well. And unfortunately, I think the needle has moved in the wrong direction and those numbers are higher and they're here to stay. Good point. Jeff, how about your perspective? What do you see on this? You've, you've tried cases. You've been in front of, uh, you know, juries with, uh, you know, bad defendants and uh, very badly injured plaintiffs. How are you seeing this? Well, I'm, you know, a contemporary with Jeff Miller in terms of age. Uh, but, you know, we're seeing eight figure demands, eight figure demands, not regularly, but often and presented with no 
embarrassment. You know, partly they're backing them up by the economics and blackboarding numbers. You know, life care plans are absolutely astounding now. Uh, wages and, and ben benefits um, are relatively stagnant, actually. It's really the pain and suffering awards that not only they think a jury will award, but that they think the appellate division and the court of, of appeals will uphold. It's truly a remarkable trend. Um, from an economic perspective, I wonder if it's keeping, I, I think it's uh, uh, way ahead of inflationary pressures. And uh, I, I don't see an end to it. Uh, at this point in terms of it increasing at this, you know, uh, just uh, rapid uh, and incredible rate. You think it's been exacerbated uh, by the fact that we've been in COVID for almost two years and, you know, people's um, sense of pain and suffering and deprivation is heightened because of all of that we've endured? I don't know that it, currently COVID has an effect on what we're seeing, but I think that that's a good point in bringing up what we might see over the course of the next five years and what the tolerance level is. Maybe there'll be some type of rebound uh, that might put more of a cap on what we see in terms of pain and suffering. Uh, that I think is yet to be determined, but it's certainly a, a point of uh, watching and perhaps even measuring. And, and I can tell you this, I, I, I finished a mediation about 15 minutes before this started. It was a New York labor law case. I was, I was not defending this particular one. I was involved as coverage counsel. Young fella, couple surgeries, claims he could never work again. The demand was 9.8 million. They wouldn't even talk until my client's policy was up and my subcontractor's policy was up. So until 2 million was on the table, they weren't even talking. And this was the third mediation. So there's, I had to stop because we were doing this. That mediation is still going because our, our limits have been tendered. It's just crazy. And at the, you know, when COVID first came down, I had a lot of people say to me, you know, certainly on my defense stuff, hey, let's try, I bet people wanna settle cases. And what I found, and, and you know, everyone else on the call can comment, was if you had a small plaintiff's firm with maybe not such a great case, they'd be willing to settle. But your big cases with good firms who were well-financed, they're not letting go of their cases cheap because it might take an extra year or two to try the case, especially if they have summary judgment and they got 9% interest. But before we continue the, on this, I, I got a question on the chat. Um, Great. And hold on one second. Let's have it. Yep. Hold on, let me just, where'd it go? Hold on. The basic question was, if this legis, legis, and this might be more of a question for Doug, if legislation passes, given all of the pressure that is already on claim adjusters, to comply with various, you know, in-house, you know, inside the insurance company regulations, outside regulations, and what their pay level is. What do you think that might do to your business in terms of your ability to hire and retain good claims people? Neil, I love you. You keep on bouncing this stuff to me. So here's the here's the <laughs> answer. Um, I want to keep you mind. involved. I, I love you, Neil. I love you. <laughs> Here, here's well currently the industry itself prior to any of this legislation and i'm talking about nationwide we're having a staffing shortage and i know that some, some of my brethren and other carriers are having problems uh staffing it, it, there's less people that do it less really qualified very experienced claims reps that do it and um there's a tug of war getting the really uh really really uh experienced claims reps to handle uh, claims like this. Now, add that on, like you're saying, Neil, on top of that, it would be very, I think first off, it'd be very hard for insurance carriers to compensate claim reps to do that, that's A. And B, I think that the, uh, I think it would be an issue to in, in staffing. Um, one other thing I wanted to bring up that I, 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 Mark kind of alluded to previously was the timeliness and how strict it is. You understand, though, that and, and everybody I'm sure on the call may understand this is that New York is very slow litigiously. 
you, Neil, your case is how long, your mediation that you just had 15 minutes ago, how long has that been in litigation before you got to your first mediation? So well, you're- it, It's not that old a case. The date of loss was 2011. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so not only that, you have now that added pressure to resolve or potentially disclaim a claim, a case, uh, uh, deny a claim, a, a case quickly, but the courts are going to drag it out. There, there's no increase in staffing in the courts that I know of that will help make move these cases along even faster. So as a carrier, we have to hurry up and slow down. Great point. Great point. Now, let me ask uh, Neil and Mark and Jeff and Jeff, do you foresee now with a $20 million, let's say a non-economic damage base, do you foresee a new era of the golden age of uh, forum shopping and uh, things everybody fighting to get? It used to be in the Bronx, people want it to be, but now it could be the Bronx, it could be Kings, which is also plaintiff friendly. New York County, Live Nation was in New York County. Do you think this is now going to be the, the golden age of plaintiff forum shopping? So in, in response to that, um, that has always been the case in our industry. The only significant change, and again, this shows how the defense bar is always playing catch up, um, is the amendment recent, relatively recent amendment to the CPLR, which lets you place venue basically wherever the plaintiffs want it. So if I'm a plaintiff's attorney and I have a good case that theoretically should be brought in Westchester or under the old law would have to be brought in Westchester, I send my plaintiff across the border into the Bronx to get all the chiropractor treatment. And then I argue that that's the proper venue based on the new laws because that's where he, he or she received their treatment. And whenever we discuss or round table cases in our office, and we do this every day on every case to determine settlement value, the first two questions we ask are, who's the plaintiff's lawyer and where is the case venue? Before we ask anything about the facts or the injuries, because those, the answer to those two questions affect the analysis on everything else. And with regards to the $20 million verdict, I just want to remind everybody that the In Re Crane Collapse case, which was a wrongful death case out of the appellate division in 2017, sustained the largest verdict in history of New York two people died, the jury awarded, now the, the fact pattern is horrendous and we don't have time to go into it, but the jury awarded $95 million and blew conscious pain and suffering uh, verdicts out you know, off the planet. The appellate division first department sustained $35 million, which was by far the largest verdict award, jury award that has ever been sustained. So, uh, you know, I think that this is a, unfortunately or fortunately a precursor to the future. And, and you know, when, when you look at the numbers that, especially in the labor law, where an iron worker uh, can, you know, blackboard with regards to earning, future lost earnings, union benefits, uh, future medical costs, the, the, the numbers just you know, open up a telephone book and add six to seven zeros, and you're probably right there. That's a great uh, comment. And let me just use this as a segue uh, to move into the one of the things that we wanted to talk about, which is what's the effect of absolute liability and the labor law on construction and insurance? 
Uh, that's slide 16, uh, which we all know um, is a one of a kind law and makes the premiums and the funding a very, very, uh, very problematic in New York. Um, Neil, want to comment on that? <laughs> Don't worry, Neil's going to pitch it to me. Okay, good. <laughs> Somebody good. pitch it to Shulman. Pitch it to Shulman. All right. Neil, you're muted. You're muted, Neil. So are we discussing my thoughts on whether this law is ever going to be changed? Is that? No, I, you know, I mean, obviously construction is a, a big industry in New York. And what happens with construction is you have to build in the cost of the increased insurance because of the, uh, the labor law. It's a given, you know. So uh, insurance premiums in New York, construction premiums in New York, as, as Doug has, has, has said uh, and Jack has noted, are, you know, one of a kind. So we can expect this to continue and we can expect uh, no break from this, I think. So you've, you, you've got a couple of scenarios with the insurance, Tom. One, Good. those carriers who do not wish to have this risk appetite don't write contractors, owners, and subcontractors in New York, and they're out of the market. Two, those who do and who write for significant insureds are fetching very significant premiums, right? The cost of doing business as an owner or contractor with a, with a legit insurance company who's actually providing coverage for a labor law case can be staggering, right? Three, you have, even with insurance companies who are receiving big premiums, of course we know in every labor law case, the name of the game is risk transfer and there can be a penalty to the insured if they have an inability to pass their risk through, which is why you might see on a policy a New York conditions clause, right? That requires as a condition to coverage that the insured have an executed written contract that provides for indemnity, as well as additional insured coverage on a primary non-contributory basis. And if they have not obtained both, then there is no coverage under their policy for a loss. So, you know, you've got a lot of you know, insurance companies trying to figure out ways to, if they want to write the business in New York, how can they get around it? You know, how can they try and, you know, stem their risk or, you know, hedge their risk, I should say, on, on these cases. And so, of course, there's tremendous litigation spawn over these either exclusions or conditions in policies dealing with risk transfer and penalties against the insured if they don't have it. So I mean, that's, that's what's going on every day. And, and as a practical on the ground effect of this, for example, uh, in Buffalo uh, 25 years ago, you had ironworking subcontractors in 30 to 40 uh, uh, family-owned businesses, successful businesses that provided ironworking services for the industry. Now you're down to less than five and it's due to insurance costs because these subcontractors, these mom and pops can't afford the premiums that a large general contractor or real estate development firm can afford. And it's put tons of companies out of business. And as Neil also commented, it's also uh, provided that a lot of insurers just do not have the appetite to write in New York. It's become a, an absolute uh, uh, problem for the insurance industry and for small business. We so expect that to continue, right? Absolutely. There's a lot of illusory policies out there as well. That Meaning have what, so Mark? You want to just explain that a little bit clearer? Yeah, they, they have so many exclusions in the policies that when I lecture on this, I, I say that the only time they provide coverage is on a leap year and it has to happen on a Sunday and it has to be raining. But they'll have um, employee exclusions, which you see all the time. They'll have, they won't have additional, uh, the broad form contractual endorsement coverage. They'll exclude jobs 
in the five boroughs. They'll exclude jobs over three stories when they're insuring a contractor that installs skylights 10 floors up. And, you know, in our practice, we mostly represent the owners, general contractors. And it's not fun for us to tell Doug, well, you got a great contract and you got contractual indemnification and the contract provides for additional insured coverage. And oh, by the way, uh, Joe Fly-By-Night contractor who owns a 1998 pickup truck as their corporate assets doesn't have an insurance policy that provides coverage, GL coverage for this loss. It's kind of ironic that sometimes we're happy to be confronted with a grave injury because at least then we have the one B carrier in the case and we don't have to rely upon the GL coverage, which admittedly is counterintuitive, but welcome to our world. Neil, there's a question in the question and answer. You want to- uh, Oh, I'm it? sorry. I, I was looking at something and I didn't see it. Hold on. Oh, here's a great question. What efforts is PMT and the defense bar and insurance industry doing to combat the proposed legislative changes on bad faith? Kick it to Doug. <laughs> I got a good answer. I call Mark. <laughs> The truth is, is that PMT has been more and more involved, but you'll hear Mark Pillinger tell you that the defense bar stinks at lobbying and how strong the plaintiff's bar is. Um, we participated in when the one point, the 240 under the labor law was being challenged before uh, Sheldon Silver put a quash on it. Uh, Leslie Abley of our office was on the committee. And we're getting involved in this with the defense organizations to try to, but it's, it, it, it's sad to say, and I'm not being a defeatist here, that the plaintiff's bar and lobby is just so much more effective and so much more active than the defense side. Well, there's a quote that, uh, that uh, former Governor Cuomo uh, used to say, he would say, the trial lawyers are the single most powerful political force in Albany. And, and that is very true. Since I sit on the board of the academy, um, I'm almost like, I'm the one of two defense attorneys on the board. So uh, I'm kind of an infiltrator. And the defense bar, the insurance companies, the real estate industry have a lot to learn from the plaintiff's bar when it comes to lobbying, supporting judicial candidates who are more moderate, down the road, because Supreme Court judges run. And to run, they need money and they need people to donate money so that they can campaign. Um, and we're terrible at it. We, we do lobby. It's not that we don't, but you know, we're the rowboat and the plaintiff's bar is the battleship. And that's the best analogy I can give you. It's a great but, analogy. Great Deb, analogy. Hold on, I have another, I have another question. Great. Okay. In addition, what efforts are PMT and defense bar and insurance industry taking to work with RABNY, R-A-B-N-Y, cooperatives, trade unions who are being put out of business by high insurance rates to lobby for labor law modification to include comparative fault for labor law 240? So, so let me just throw something in here. We've as long as I've been in the industry, Jeff Miller knows this, everybody's been asking, what do we have to do to get rid of labor law? Here's to me what an answer to that is. What would you give back to the plaintiff's lobby to get rid of labor law? 
I mean, you you have to give them something back or you ain't you're not getting rid of it. it it's I hate to say it. I'd love for us to all get together and be very well organized um, like Illinois was there. I think they were the second last state to get rid of it. Right. We were. Get rid of it. But the plaintiff's lobby is so strong in the state with the unions as well. What would we give back for for as a as a, a collective group to the plaintiffs side? Because that's and you know the only something, no Doug. Of. You know something is that we're really not looking to abolish the labor law. We just want comparative back in play on the two forty. And uh, yeah. yeah, we got to give so something we, back. Maybe moving the nine percent summary judgment down to four percent would be something we can get back. I mean, yeah, you, you got even if you yeah. take. The, the absolute liability out of 240, you got to give them something. I hate to say it, to, to make it work instead of just trudging along, you got to give them something back. So I, I don't know what it is. I don't know where it would be. Um, but, you know, you got to give something back. Plus, there's got to be some way of realistically restricting down 240. I think to me, that's the better argument because. We all know that when it goes all the way up, they're going to find labor. They always do. Even when it's not what it's intended to do, they find it. it's found. I think perhaps an easy concession could be to negotiate the statute of limitations for negligence cases. I don't think we're giving away much by doing that in terms of exposure. Uh, you know, if you look at the COVID toll, you know, I just don't think we're giving up that much. And I think that's a good bargaining chip. Uh, that wouldn't have a grave effect on on the defense bar. You're saying extended past three years? Yeah. <coughs> That's interesting because New, New York's actually a state, the three-year statute in New York is actually longer than in many states that have two-year statute of limitations on negligence. Yeah. So um, I'm going to throw out, and I don't know the answer, <coughs> excuse me, a question to the panel. I'm going to pretend I'm Tom Bone. <laughs> if you were a workers' comp carrier in New York, such as New York State, which is the largest comp writer of workers' comp insurance, would you be in favor of doing away with the labor law, which is the statute that guarantees, in effect, that you get back two-thirds of what you have paid out to an injured worker. Uh, it would then put the onus on the comp carrier to actually, and I'm not saying they don't do it now, so that is my disclaimer, handle the claims and challenge the need for the surgery rather than approving the disectomy five years after the accident, confident in the fact that the plaintiff fell off the ladder and you're gonna get your money back anyway. Mark, I will say that is a great point. Um, and I've had this discussion with a lot of people and I don't think anyone's ever raised the issue of comp. So I think you're right. I think the state insurance fund would be against an amendment because you're right. They're, they're getting two thirds of their money back on these cases. Right. Yeah, right. that's a good point. And, and this is something that has been proposed and it's, you know, again, changing uh, the damages in a wrongful death case to people who are, you know, non-family members and for also uh, it, would, it would change it to, um, non-economic damages as well. Uh, does this one have a chance of getting past Mark? Not only does it have a chance of getting past, I am, um, I would predict that this is going to get past. There is very strong support for this amendment. And speaking for myself, the current state of the law in New York, which is very old, 
um, really is an unfair, unfair abridgment of who can recover in New York under the wrongful death statute and um, the, the measure of damages. Uh, it, it seems to me very unfair that um, a nephew or a niece who has been brought up by the aunt who dies in an accident, the, the aunt dies in an accident, if they are not within the zone of danger, that they are not within the class of people who uh, have a right to uh, claim benefits under the wrongful death statute. Is New York so, the only statute, the only state that has this, this particular iteration of the law or the other states that still are in the same mode as we are? I do not know. I am not sure. Okay. So... I have to love this though, because the labor law has probably been on the books almost as long as the current law. It has. And yet we can't get that changed, but they want to change this. <laughs> and that- Because it's an all, expansion of the claimant's rights. Yes, I know. It, that all, <laughs> we, of course. We, so look, everybody on this panel and everybody who's listening in, understands that the view of the public is that the business of an insurance company is to pay out money whether they should pay money and or whether the claimant is entitled to recover money. The other uh, impression of insurance companies is that they have an unlimited amount of money to pay, that they are the federal government, you know, <laughs> pass a trillion dollar budget or a billion dollars here, a billion dollars there. Um, you know, during the COVID issues, about whether business interruption is, is covered under the policies and that's out of this context. But I couldn't help but thinking that they want the insurance industry to cover a major loss that they did not price for, intend to coverage, intend to provide coverage or collect premium to offset these costs. But I didn't hear anybody running to say, let's rescue the insurance industry by using governmental funds to prop up or cover or pay. And this is, you know, we're not out of this issue yet, obviously. Mark, well, isn't one of the uh, isn't one of the themes underlying the bad faith legislation, you know, populism and the desire to punish insurance companies for perceived past offenses, whether they be Hurricane Sandy or whatever, where insurance companies, you know, were not as as uh, responsible or you know in or uh, didn't settle cases that people wanted settled. So this is now we've got. A majority now we can do things so now it's time to turn the table isn't that part or, of what this is all about i that that's not part that's the primary nobody is going to say that the insurance industry many times takes longer to adjust a claim especially i'm talking of first party laws than than they should okay but as I said in my article, your your dealing with something that should be cured with a scalpel, and you're hitting it with a nuclear bomb. 
Yes, that's all true, but uh, try and explain that to uh, the legislature in New York. And you talk about, you know, uh, people who one haven't had business experience. Uh, when there was a Republican state Senate, you had a check and balance system. And even when they lost the, the majority, you had some breakaway Democrats who banded with them to give them a majority. And you also had a, you know, a business, uh, you know, a governor who understood business in New York, which was, which was Cuomo. And now when you move all three of those things away, you basically say, well, here it is. What do you got? What does the legislature want to do? And there are a lot of people who just really are angry with insurance companies and want to punish them. And this may not be the end of the type of legislation that we see coming out of the legislature in New York. That's my opinion. But I think you're going to see, you know, other things that they've been wanting to have passed for a long time. For example, you know, the bad faith legislation has been bouncing around since 2013 when it was first introduced. But now it's finally got you know some some legs on it because they've got a supermajority in both houses. Well, also the um, opening up of the statute of limitations in sexual assault cases. Um, I'm not saying I'm not arguing the good or the bad of that, but a 35 year old claim that now the insurance company is confronted with whether they provide coverage or not, again, is another topic for another day. Um, but, but it's always been this way. So, you know, if in the, you know, before you, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, if we would assert a lack of personal jurisdiction defense, affirmative defense, and then arguably we would sit back, wait for the statute of limitations to run, and then move to dismiss for lack of personal jurisdiction. So the plaintiff's bar couldn't refile. It is the burden of the plaintiff's bar to make good and proper service, or it was, on a defendant because when we were successful in these actions, the plaintiff's, the att plaintiff's attorney's malpractice carrier became the claimant's GL carrier. The legislature changes the law and says, now within 120 days, we have to move on our affirmative defense of lack of personal jurisdiction shifting the burden on us to with regards to appropriate service all right you want to argue that that was a trap and the poor plaintiffs were not getting their day in court i understand that you want to argue it's an affirmative defense and therefore it's our burden of proof i don't disagree with that we have to prove that they're service was improper but why do i have to do it in 120 days well so. because there are legislators who listen to the uh the, the the plaintiff's bar and they're legislators who are themselves plaintiff's attorneys and then they get to albany and they say wait a second i really don't like this part of the law i think we should change it and so events happen and you get these kinds of things because people say, wait a second, I'm a kid in a candy store. I want to change all these kinds of things and make it so that it's easier for you know a plaintiff to practice than it is for a defendant to practice. Because besides, they and, get paid by insurance companies. Right. And their voters are never going to be angry at them for what they do to their insurance premiums because they're never going to make the logical jump between legislation that is pro plaintiff's lawyers or pro plaintiffs, I have to be careful, and the dollars that they pay for their car insurance, 
or their homeowner's insurance or their business insurance. Um, you know, nobody sees the trickle down effect. Okay. Good point. Uh, are we still in a hard market, uh, Jack and, uh, and Doug, um, in the insurance? Mm. Yes, we are still in a hard market. Um, the various indice, indices show um, slowing of the rate increases, or maybe maybe even it has leveled off for certain certain lines of coverage. Um, but it's leveled off at uh, uh, in a place that's still drastically uh, higher in cost than um, than it was a, a few years ago. And there are significant exceptions to that. But I, the one I'll mention is cyber insurance, which is fast becoming a staple of the corporate insurance program. Pricing there uh, this year is up, I'm gonna say 40% or so. And self-insured retentions or deductibles are, um, are up double, triple. Um, so, uh, and I, you know, I, I think that underlies a lot of our discussion uh, today. Insurers operate on the annual trade. So if, if they lose money this year, they increase rates next year. That's easier said than done in highly regulated lines of insurance like auto and workers comp, but in less regulated lines of insurance like various types of professional liability, cyber insurance, uh, DNO, there's relative freedom to increase rates for uh, for commercial insureds. And you know, I, I you asked a question before about you know what is the industry uh, doing to um, you know advocate for itself in New York? And uh, you know, our our answer on the panel was kind of a yawn. And, um, you know, I think that's, uh, you can relate it back to the economic behavior of the insurance industry, and it contemplates that annual trade. So, you know, the, the, uh, the costs are ultimately borne by the insured and even distributed out further um, to, uh, um, you know, people that, buy the products of the organizations that are uh, tenants in a newly constructed uh, office building. So, you know, uh, one of the questions is how much more is it worth to be in what I think is the number one place in the world, New York City? I, I don't know, it remains to be seen, but it, the market is hard and insurers operate on the annual trade. So they feel we might be wrong this year but we can adjust. Good, thank you. Great, great answer, Jack. Dr. Brown, uh, insurance uh, hardened soft markets are cyclical, are they not? And will this turn to a soft market when there's more capacity and people come in? Yeah, I mean, the, the history for what, over a hundred years now, as long as people have been following this is that uh, we go through hard and, and soft markets and every reason to believe that that, that will continue. Um, there was some talk before the most recent hard market about maybe the um, insurance cycle being over because we were in a soft market for so long. But um, sure enough, we have a hard market. And just as soon as the sun will come up tomorrow, uh, the cycle will turn again. I think, I think the important thing people need to realize though, is it's not really a cycle, like a sinusoidal kind of up and down. Um, it, but prices do go up and down. It's just not as systematic as, as people think um, it should be or they, or they were taught. It's not a six-year cycle um, exactly, but yeah, prices will go up and down for sure for the reasons um, Jack Jennings said. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is it also uh, a fact that, like Jack said, that a lot of the increases are going to eventually be passed along in the policies and borne by you know, the policyholders, the consumers, the tenants, the businesses, everything kind of trickles down to its lowest level. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I fully expect um, if there's a new bad faith law and that leads to 
increases in loss costs that, that will eventually be passed through in, in the form of premiums eventually. So I think when we talk about laws like this, it's kind of a, um, a resetting of how the insurance business works to some extent, but the, the fundamental idea that the insurance customers are ultimately going to pay for the losses, um, that's not going to change. Otherwise, the insurance industry would disappear. Um, I'd like to, again, thank uh, St. John's, the uh, Tobin uh, College of Business. I'd like to thank uh, um, Dean Schweitzer and Dean Sharp. I'd like to thank Dr. Brown uh, for being on our panel. I'd like to thank uh, Jack uh, Jennings and Doug Milner. Uh, thank all my partners for being a part of this. And as I said, we have a, a great relationship with St. John's. We, we love being part of uh, the St. John's and the uh, School of Risk Management and hope to continue our conference series in the fall. And I'd also like to thank, uh, most importantly also, uh, uh, Joe Levine and Rob Stewart, our behind the scenes guy who handle our, our audio visual, our branding and our marketing for helping us put this all together and get all the word out there. So uh, if anyone has questions, you can always contact us. We'll be happy to answer them. Any one of our panelists, uh, myself, Mark, Neil, uh, Samberski, uh, Jeff Miller, uh, Jeff uh, Shulman, we have, our emails and our on our webpage and feel free to contact us. We're always happy to serve as an information resource. If anyone would like a webinar, we have a catalog of webinars that we're happy to give and we'd be happy to talk to anyone about uh, uh, either questions or webinars if they should arise outside the course of our Zoom meeting. So without any further ado and without any further uh, questions or, or comments, I'd really like to thank everyone once again. This is a real privilege to be uh, giving uh, these webinars, these conference series, and with these industry leaders that we have. And I'd like to thank everybody. I'd like to thank Larry Castell, uh, uh, who was very, very instrumental in helping us put this together with all the nuts and bolts behind the scenes, as you can imagine, and uh, everyone else too. So thanks everyone for uh, a very informative and provocative. You know, we do these because we want to raise questions, questions that may not get an answer, but we're going to raise them because guess what? People are going to have these questions. And if this passes, the first thing they're going to say is, gee, I think I saw something about that. Maybe it was on the St. John's PMT uh, webinar and I'd like to see that. So thanks very much. And everyone have a nice weekend, a happy holiday season, and everyone stay well and safe. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Nice job. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Yes. Happy, safe Thanksgiving. Thank you.